Father, thank you that you give us this opportunity just to seek your face. God, that you enable us to pursue you in your word. And we ask now, God, that um, the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Hebrews, Jesus is better, so persevere. That's what we're learning about in Hebrews. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Wow, what, what amazing, comforting words these are. When we think about the high priest, we, we think about the Day of Atonement. That was the most crucial day for a priest. And only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. And he could only do that through the sacrifice of blood. And he could only do that one time a year. And what that was doing is displaying for us the absolute holiness of God. So when the priest drew near, when he came into the temple, he would light incense, which would create a cloud of smoke. And that too was meant to shield him from the direct presence of God. Because sinners in the presence of a holy God is a dangerous thing. Only, only the holy can draw near. And the priest is showing us through the sacrifice of blood that one day through the perfect blood of Jesus, we will be able to draw near. So in the picture over here, you see a priest beginning to draw near to the throne of God. The throne of God was meant to be displayed and understood to be the Ark of the Covenant, which is why it's called the mercy seat. This is where Israel would receive their propitiation one time a year. And you had cherubim on the right and to the left of the Ark of the Covenant. And that also was a display of God's heavenly court, where only those who were summoned into his presence were able to enter and worship the high king. Now listen to Leviticus 16. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, after the death of the two sons of Aaron, remember Nadab and Abihu, they were both killed, not only because of what they were doing, getting drunk at the tent, but because they were drawing near to God in a way that did not honor him. So it says, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So the priest in the Old Testament was meant to symbolize the priestly ministry that Jesus Christ has now. And that's what we're gonna enter into in chapters 4 all the way through chapter 10 of Hebrews. So this is a huge chunk of the book, and it shows us just how central to our faith, to our security, is the priesthood of Christ. If we don't understand the ministry of Christ as priest, then we don't quite understand his salvation. And so that's, that's what we want to jump into this morning. Now, Jesus, amazingly, is not just called the high priest. There, there are always only one high priest that could enter once, once a year into the 
holy place. He's the great high priest. And so you cannot get any greater or higher than this majestic high priest. The passage says, since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Now, now what, is, what is the author doing here? Well, first of all, again, he, he's saying Jesus is now our high priest. And look, he is a great high priest because he didn't just pass through the curtain of the temple. He actually passed through the heavens. And he's not just drawing near to God in a symbolic way, which is what is happening in the temple, but Jesus, the actual Son of God, is now appearing in the actual presence of God in the heavenly realm. So this high priest is so much greater than any other priest. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 2, it says that we have so great a salvation. The reason our salvation is so great is because the one who is securing our salvation is so great. We, we have someone representing us before God who's the actual perfect son of God, who's actually in the real presence of God. How much more secure could our salvation be? B. So, what is the therefore? Since we have such a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, who's now before the throne of God, representing us before God in his perfect presence, what should be our application today? Well, the author says, let us Hold fast our confession. Let us hold fast our confession. Essentially, this is saying the truth of the gospel about this great high priest, about Jesus, needs to be held on to very tightly. We need to continue to confess Christ with our mouth and with our lives. We need to continue to walk in faith and obedience. The message says it like this, let's not let it slip through our fingers. Or the NIV, let us hold firmly or tightly to the faith we profess. On the right hand there, you'll see a, um, a baseball player and if you know a lot about baseball, you probably know what's happening here. This is when uh, Bill Buckner, infamously in the 1986 World Series, where it's the Boston Red Sox against the New York Mets, allowed a ball to go through his legs, and it ended up enabling the Mets to win the World Series. And it was a tragic mistake. And he had put his hand down to get the ball, but because his mitt was a little flimsy, it didn't go down all the way, and the ball just slipped through, and it had cataclysmic consequences in the baseball world. That's a little bit of a picture of what the author in Hebrews is trying to tell us. He's trying to tell us that, look, we live in a world where our faith can be slippery in our hands because Satan's trying to tempt us because we have sin on our own hearts that deceive us and because we live in a world that says that our faith our confession is foolish I mean think about going to your neighbors and and without any way compromising the message sharing the gospel with them and then sharing what all the implications are of that are for sexuality and you can imagine the response that you would get. So this faith that we have, we need to hold tightly to because it can easily slip through our hands, our confession, if we are not watchful. We need to hold to it tightly lest we also drift away. You'll notice in Hebrews that over and over again, 
many, many times the author will say essentially the same thing. And that is persevere, endure, hold fast, which assumes that walking in obedience to God over a lifetime is not easy. And, and we need to continually run to Jesus, our high priest, so that we might not fall away. Another way to think about it is hold the fort. We're supposed to hold on to our confession. Another way to think about that, another image might be holding on to the fort. You, you can think about a great battle in Lord of the Rings. Uh, or you can even think about what happened recently, um, the Hagia Sophia um, in Istanbul has, has recently been, been made a mosque. And way back, it actually used to be a church up until 1453 when the Ottomans had taken over the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And the Hagia Sophia is a beautiful, grand church. And it's, it's one of the most massive buildings you'll ever see. You'll see minarets now on the side. Those, those are because it's now a mosque. Um, it was just recently converted back into a mosque within the past couple of weeks. And the story behind it is that the, um, the people in Constantinople, that's what Istanbul used to be called before it was taken over by the Ottoman Empire, you had, the, you had Constantinople, and you had the Ottoman, the Ottoman warriors trying to come into Constantinople with their massive walls. And, and for days and days and days, the, the people of Rome, the people in Constantinople, were fighting off the, the Ottoman warriors. And at one point, legend says that one of the soldiers inside Constantinople went to relieve himself and opened the doorway. And that is what allowed the destruction of Constantinople because then the, then the enemies were able to come in and sack the city. Now, if that's a true story or not, we don't know for sure, but we do know it's because of those inside Constantinople who are trying to run away and opening up the doors that it allowed the Ottomans to come in and take over the city. That's a little picture of what we're dealing with in Hebrews. It's saying, hold the fort, hold your soul, be watchful. You have an enemy of your soul who's trying to sift your faith like wheat. You'll remember that's what happened with Peter in the Gospels, where, where Jesus, as Peter's priest, said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift your faith, faith like wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Let us then, so in view of, in view of our great high priest and all that he's accomplished for us, and in view of the reality that we have enemies of our soul who are trying to sabotage our faith, here's what we're called to do this morning. Let us then, in view of that, with confidence. Can you imagine scripture saying that? We just talked about how the, the priest, the high priest, could only enter into the holy place one time a year and not without the shedding of blood. And, and it was a big ordeal. He had to put on all his holy garb and he had to go through all the ritual cleansing. And he had, a, he had a rope tied around his waist in case the, the holy presence of God incinerated him. And now, because of our priest today, not only the priest, but all his people are encouraged then with confidence to draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, this is just remarkable. And this is the means to enduring in the faith. If we do not avail ourselves 
of the throne of, of grace, we will not persevere. This is the means by which God enables us to continue to faithfully walk with him. So think about it. How often do you, do you avail yourself of God's throne? How often do you, do you run to him that you might find grace? Grace that you don't have right now, but grace that's waiting for you if you will only draw near. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Look at those three words in red. Grace, mercy, grace. That's a place you want to avail, <clears throat> avail yourself of. Because of the blood of Jesus, when you go to the throne of God, you do not expect wrath. Instead, with confidence, you can expect grace and mercy that will give you a well-timed help. That's literally what the Greek says, a well-timed help. So God will give you precisely what you need when you need it if you will avail yourself of the grace that comes from God's throne. So, what the author of Hebrews is saying this morning to us, Jubilee, is we are all in a battle. There are enemies waging war outside the walls of our city, outside the walls of our soul. And we need help. We need to persevere. We need to hold fast our confession. We need to hold the fort for one another. In the church, we need to guard one another. But the only way we can do that is by with confidence drawing near to the throne of grace to give us what we need. And if, if, we, if we don't feel like God will hear us, let's remember that the priest who represents us now doesn't just live here on earth entering a physical temple. No, our high priest today is so great. He's actually the son of God who passed through the heavens and is now literally before God right now on our behalf. I pray that will give you great encouragement this morning. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much that your word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and helping us to